Right, so we are in Trieste. This title actually comes because it uh, was my last lecture in December at Lund University. I'm moving out of Lund, so I'm moving somewhere. I'll show you later on. Uh, I have two, still two affiliations. So one is Swedish now for Lund University and one for Nova Gorica. In Lund, I still have a group of approximately 15 people right now. Okay, so we'll talk about evolutionary history now, and yeast is my model. So what I've been trying to do for the last two decades is to understand biological and molecular processes which operated hundreds of million years ago. So I'm especially interested in the events 100, 150 million years ago. You'll understand later on why, why that timing now. How do we do that? How do we reconstruct the things? One is by comparing modern organisms and then a good help is if we have fossils, because fossils, they actually tell us what were the evolutionary intermediates and they contribute with timing. Now to make things a bit easier for you, we'll do it with reptiles, because with reptiles, things are easier to illustrate than with yeast, at least to start with. You'll, you'll see later why it is. So when we reconstruct the reptiles evolutionary history, one, one approach is we compare modern organisms. I'll do exactly the same then with yeast now. So you have a mo two modern reptiles now, and then if you compare them, then you can see, for example, how the, how the legs now were changing during the history. And when you compare these two, then you can also reconstruct the grandfather, the common progenitor, and then on the basis of this, then you can also see, for example, how the things developed. So he, this is not really molecular, but you know, snakes, they had legs a few years ago, maybe a few million years ago, and they lost them now. And we can still see some of the remnants. So that's the principle. Modern organisms, we compare either on the macro level or micro or molecular level, and then we can get an in, intermediate. And then, if we have a fossil, this is not a fish, it's also a reptile, Ichthyosaurus. This can tell us also how exactly it looked like. And you can see here, the legs are completely different, right, in, in this particular branch. But it can tell us about the timing, because we have dating methods for fossils. We know which layer they are coming from, and we can also, with isotope techniques, with other techniques, we can find out how old this particular organism is. This is less than 100 million years old now. So then the main point is then is that we try to reconstruct the reverted Christmas tree, right? So this is an um, evolutionary tree. And then we have a reconstructed uh, grandfather of all reptiles, Cotylosaur. And then we have some branches which are still present now, and then we have some which have disappeared, and then here on these branches, then we can put different events. For example, an interesting event is here, what has happened with these legs in Ichthyosaurus, because they were modified, and what has happened with, uh, for example, with legs here in this branch of modern organisms. And then we can also see how the evolution continues. Here we have the progenitor of the, the first um, of the first mammals. So it's still a reptile-like organism, but it leads to mammals. And then you have a big change, you know, with the, for example, with keeping the temperature and, and so on and so on. So this is quite well documented. And it's well documented because we have fossils. When we are talking about the microbes, yeast, we have no fossils, nothing we can use. So what about timing now? We didn't have any idea about the timing when I started uh, to do research on yeast. Uh, and actually, what, what do you think, how many years we know about the timing? It's actually exactly 10 years now, a little bit more. Because the first timing we got with the comparative genomics, and this is a phylogenetic tree because we are still in the new year, Christmas period, so it's just a returned Christmas tree, right? Half of it. So these are the species which were sequenced in 2003. And by comparative genomics, 
and comparing the accumulation of neutral mutations in the ribosomal cluster, we could approximately deduce the timing of the split of different branches. And it is first then that we know that Candida albicans, which is quite similar to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, branched out more than 200 million years ago. Before, people thought, well, anything, you know, 10 million or 500 million or whatever. For Schizosaccharomyces pomba, probably the second best studied yeast, we know that the branching is much more than 250 million years. So now, if we compare these three, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you would know. Some of you would know Candida glabrata. Some of you would know also Cluvermyces lactis. Candida albicans, everybody should know because we all have it in one or another place of the body. Now in Pombe, you would know. So if we compare it to the vertebrate evolution, we would put cerevisia, and then we would put somewhere here reptiles. And down here, we could put fish already, and here we would put, for example, lamprey. So very dramatic phylogenetic tree for vertebrates, big things. But imagine, fish and us, we are more related than Saccharomyces cerevisia and Candida albicans are. So there is a much bigger span. And we know that only for 10 years, right? And we have this approximate dating. And dating is really approximate because there are no fossils. And it is getting better and better with the bioinformatic methods. So just when I'll be talking about the evolution now, we'll be in this particular branch. And we will be talking about organisms which had the common progenitor approximately 250 million years. And I'll try to put some evolutionary events. And I'm not going to talk about legs and tails like in reptiles, but I'll talk about some molecular things. OK, this was the first introduction. Now the second introduction. So now we go into yeast. What's interesting with yeasts? What, what is really unique in yeasts, what other organisms cannot do? They can do many things which are interesting, like switching the mating type, like many things you can find. But what is really relevant for everyone, not even for researcher, is this ability with the final product. Saccharomyces yeasts, they can degrade sugars only to C3 and C2 compounds even when oxygen is present. And from the human perspective, we talk a lot about this energy now, no? bioethanol, oil disappearing. We want to have it optimal, but this is not optimal at all. Because even when oxygen is present, they get only less than 10% of energy out of organic compounds like hexosis, and they make C2 compound. Another phenotype which is very interesting is also that these yeasts, they learned how to survive without oxygen. Originally, yeasts are aerobic organisms, but they also rewire the whole metabolism so they can survive without oxygen. There is some coupling between these two, but I think it's a bit too early and too speculative next time when I come. Usually, I come every 20 years, right? I was here. I think I was 94 I was here, right? So maybe I can tell you now. Both of us in wheelchair, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So I'll mainly concentrate on this now, on this interesting thing now, and a little bit of repetition now of biochemistry. So we have glucose here, or any sugar, glycolysis, cascade, to pyruvate. Any normal eukaryote, it'll go all the way to CO2 if oxygen is present. And we'll have Krebs cycle here, we will have respiratory chain, and we'll have ATP synthesis. 90% of energy will be obtained here, but still yeast does it this way, no? And we get ethanol. And then if you don't believe in Darwinian 
evolution now, if you're a creationist, but you have all the rights to be so, then it's very clear. This is done because the creator of the universe wanted to create something to make our life easier, right? So uh, we can get some happiness out of life. But if you are not creationist, then you have to think this has happened because of some reasons in environment. And it gave a kind of advantage to yeast when it was invented. And yeast, even if they are not energetically, politically correct right now, they waste a lot of energy. They are winners often. Every September in the northern hemisphere, every January in southern hemisphere, Saccharomyces yeast, they would be big winners where, when sugar is present around, but there is a lot of roots. They become the predominant group of microorganisms, either on this side of the border, on the other one, or even in Sweden. Just in Sweden, no grapes. You have blueberries and things like that. But also, they start fermenting. From Sweden, I don't know, probably the most famous animal you know. We have elephants, right? We have moose, right? It's as big as elephant, 1,000 kilo. Every September, they get drunk because they go and eat wild apples in the forest, no? And then they change the behavior, right? And they go into the schools, and they try to climb the trees, and they go on the motorways, no? This is, this is a kind of entertainment we have in the north, no? Because we don't have carnival and other things. So even there, yeast become predominant, and, and ethanol is accumulated. So why is it so? And when did it happen, and what were the mechanisms? This is what I'll try to answer, and I'll try to tell you in the next 30 minutes, I'll try to summarize approximately 150 million years of evolution. Let's see if I can do that now. So here we have a typical yeast. It's not Saccharomyces cerevisia, but it becomes a Saccharomyces cerevisia. And it's a batch experiment, and you have time a little bit over a day here, and you have different parameters of on both sides. You see, when we inoculate medium, here it is approximately 2% glucose, then the glucose starts disappearing. And then the yeast, they start to grow, and ethanol starts accumulating. It's aerobic all. But when glucose disappears, and if we still have oxygen and the yeast are not disturbed, then their metabolism here, which is glycolysis and fermentation, it'll change. They have a little plateau here, and they start respiring, and that means their own excrements, ethanol, they start eating, and here in this part, when they convert ethanol into CO2, they will get out 90% of energy. This is not what you do in the wine cellar. This is not what you do when you make beer. You stop them here because you want to have ethanol. But if during these industrial processes, if you would put extra oxygen, then they will use ethanol as the carbon source, and we will get approximately 10 times more biomass also. This is logarithmic here, right? It's not very clear, but it's a logarithmic part. So we increase the biomass. This is definitely not something also what you want to do during bioethanol production. So you try to avoid the exogen in the last part. And this phenotype, it's called CREP3 effect. CREP3 was a scientist before the Second World War. He worked with cancer cells. And cancer cells, they also do the same. Not exactly the same. They don't produce ethanol. They produce lactate. And they stopped at the lactate. And just like yeast in nature, or in our organism, they use this C3 compound or C2 used by yeast as a tool to outcompete others because a majority of organisms, they are very poor drinkers. They get drunk. Majority of bacteria, when you have 1 to 2% ethanol present, they cannot grow anymore. And when you have 5% or more, it becomes toxic and they die. So in a sense, CREP3 effect, accumulation of ethanol, it's not done for us, but it is done in nature to outcompete others. So it's not so stupid now just to go to ethanol. CREP3 positive, and we have a normal yeast, 
a normal fungus, a normal eukaryote here is one of Ashbia yeasts. It has a new exotic name now. Glucose goes down. No plateau here, so it's a mixed. It's a mixed metabolism. So all these pathways present. No accumulation of ethanol. Only CO2 we get, and immediately a lot of biomass. But these yeasts also, they can, in nature, not compete with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They are partially also bad drinkers. They get sick when we have 5% of ethanol present. OK. So let's see. A normal eukaryote or a normal yeast, not Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's CREP3 negative. Here we have a cake, sugar. A majority of sugar goes into biomass. Approximately 30% or more, it will go into biomass. And then another part goes into CO2. So a lot of yeast cells, we get CO2 and practically no other metabolites produced. Very little ethanol, sometimes a little bit of acetate. And these are our Saccharomyces yeasts, CREP3 positive. A majority of cake goes into ethanol and not into biomass and CO2. And now if you look, these make a lot of babies here, right? So in principle, they should be able to outcompete those. But it never happens that way because this product here is used to inhibit those yeasts so they cannot propagate. So the life strategy here, we call life strategy of make, accumulate, consume. So Saccharomyces yeasts make alcohol, accumulate it, and use it as a weapon against all other microbes. And then when everybody dead around, and if oxygen is still present, then they start consuming, drinking slowly, and making a lot of biomass. So we believe, and other people believe, that approximately 125 million years ago, we have the origin of first excess of glucose in nature. Not the origin of glucose, but it's the first time that we have a lot of sugars, simple sugars in nature, because we have the first fossils of the first real fruits. So plants, they first started accumulating sugars in fruits approximately 125 million years ago, and then a couple of years ago there was a Nice nature publication of these fossils from a Chinese group. So these fossils are from China. There are more and more fossils coming, when, and the years somehow feed. So that would be also somehow the start of the, this strategy approximately 125 million years ago, where these yeasts could develop a strategy to inhibit the growth of competing organisms. That was the situation now when we started with our project just after I moved to Lund and, and we published this strategy in Trends of Genetics and then we started doing some experiments. Now, a beauty is that this invention of making ethanol and then later consuming it is not only found in Saccharomyces yeasts. We have another group which is a problem for wine industry. And these two groups, they separated more than 200 million years ago, which independently evolved the ability to produce ethanol and later on to use it. And this is, they're called the Decara bruxellensis, a big pain for producers of Brunello, one of the best Italian wines from Florence. A big problem if they go out of control. Because apart from making alcohol, which is fine, apart from making a lot of good aromas, which is also fine because it is present in all Brunellos, it can also make an off flavor, which gives to wine a smell of cat piece, right? Or wet leather. Third group, far related to those two, which can make a similar thing and does it and use it, in nature is Schizosaccharomyces pomba, the best started yeast. Maybe even 
this phenotype Krebs three effect invented even more times in some other groups. We are characterizing it quite well in this group and in this group, and this is something for future for me also. Well studied for cell cycle, zero studied for carbon metabolism. Okay, so let's put now some of the events, and then when I show you the experiments, I would like to put one more event here. This is the origin of the Krebs-3 effect. Saccharomyces yeast, in this group here, this group we also call the whole genome duplication group because we have an evolutionary event when the whole genome duplicated. Some genes, they got retained, a majority got lost, but more genes available. This one we date for approximately 100 million years ago. And this is the work of Ken Wolf and collaborators from 1997 now. Then we have, for example, petit, positive, petit positivity, which is coming later on. We have the quite well-documented thing, the loss of respiratory complex one in the respiratory chain. So we can put it down here approximately 150 million years ago. So the question is now, if we study all these yeasts into detail for Krebs-3 effect, then we can also add an arrow. So the first result I'll show you today will be just to adding one arrow error to this now to show the origin and the dating. So what we did, what Arne did starting 2008 approximately and just completing his PhD, he analyzed over 40 yeast species which would cover 200 million years of the evolutionary history and would run the fermenter experiments under controlled conditions and uniform conditions, something that has not been done before. And if we go back to this phylogenetic tree before, we had a lot of data from Saccharomyces yeasts, nothing from Kazakhstania, nothing from Naumovia, nothing from Nakasaomyces, even nothing from down here where we have Candida albicans. Even Candida albicans has not been studied before we started. And there has been quite plenty of results from Cluvoromyces. So a little bit, a he lot here, a little bit here we had, and nothing else studied. So we had to cover simply the whole phylogenetic span. So what we did is we'll, I'll just simplify you the results. So we studied the carbon metabolism and reconstructed it. And we focus in the following slides only on a few parameters. So we will see how the sugar cake disappears, how biomass appears, how ethanol appears, if any, how CO2 appears. And then we will try to see if yeasts are Krebs-3 effect positive or negative. And we will see, do we get a coherent picture? So can we put it as one event or many events? Or is it all just a mosaic mess? So results have been just recently published in, in PLOS One, if you want to go for more details. You cannot read the species here, a little bit on purpose, but a little bit also because it's a very busy slide. But they are organized, these 40 species, in a way that we have some controls here. But here we start with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and then just like the previous phylogenetic tree, further we move from the top here less and less and less and less related species are to Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So those down here are the least related. The split between these and these here is when the whole genome duplication takes place. And before we did these experiments, it was believed that it is the whole genome duplication which is the trigger of ethanol production. Now we have only two parameters here. The red bar tells you how much ethanol it is produced from one gram of glucose. So if it is long one, it means that it's a very Krebs-3 positive, that it's a very good alcohol producer. And if it is zero, like here, it means that we have a Krebs-3 negative species, so no alcohol production. And the blue one tells you about the biomass. So you can see here a majority of the cake is converted into biomass. 
and no ethanol. Here, a majority of cake is converted into ethanol and very little biomass. So real CREP3 positive, real CREP3 negative. But look, if you compare this blue or red, then you can see that maybe you have one statistical group of yeasts here which produce a lot of ethanol, and then you have another group here. So these are very CREP3 positive, medium CREP3 positive, and CREP3 negative. But important for the origin here, we push it much before the whole genome duplication. And when we compare these species, of Cluivermyces and Ashbia here, we know that they separated from Saccharomyces yeast 125 million years ago. That's exactly when we have the first fossils with fruits. So to simplify the results on the previous slide, if we have a phylogenetic tree, Candida albicans here, the branching here is approximately 250 million years ago. Then we have another branching here approximately 125 million years ago with Cluivoromyces. So these are still all CREP3 negative. A majority will go into biomass, practically no ethanol produced when oxygen is present. But here we have the first intermediate, La Chancia, which I've been also working for another reasons for many years. Here we have already some ethanol production and some biomass. So Somewhere here we have the origin for one or another reason, a molecular mechanism invented to push pyruvate towards ethanol and not towards CO2 and Krebs cycle. And then we have really good producers and the whole genome duplication taking place first here, right? So La Chancia does not have whole genome duplication, but it can accumulate ethanol. And you'll see it in the later experiments. I'll use it for, for the lab evolution experiments. And I will try to develop this living fossil into Saccharomyces cerevisiae regarding carbon metabolism. So these yeasts are now in different groups. It's a statistically shown now that the results I showed you on, the, on, this, on this part are serious results, so this is one group, another group, both belonging to whole genome duplication. You have the intermediate group here and CREP3 negative now. It just tells you it's a good statistics. You have a big jump here in ethanol yield, so practically zero here in Candida group, in Cluivermyces group now, and all these they produce, but you can also see it's a statistical difference between these two groups. So first mechanism taking place, and then it's second mechanism somewhere here. So at least twice there are big inventions. First to make CREP3 effect positive and then to specialize it. And the same you have with biomass yield now. You have these three groups and here you have a big fall. And also when you compare these two, it's statistically significant difference so that you have the second mechanism just to strengthen the result. So conclusions. The origin of alcohol fermentation is before the whole genome duplication approximately 125 million years ago, and it is after the split of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Cluivermyces lactis. So something happened then, and it evolved progressively. It's not one step, but there are at least two steps, probably more, probably many small things contributing to this rewiring of the carbon metabolism. The question is, do CREP3 negative yeast grow faster than CREP3 positive? Because this child here only takes a piece of the cake and throws the rest out. So we try to compare the two group of yeasts and, and see if there is any difference. Now, this is kinetics. So before, there were amounts shown. So here it is. the consumption of glucose per time, right? And you can see Saccharomyces yeast at the top, less related here. These are all whole genome duplication yeast, so this group has been together for 100 million years, and here you have other yeasts now, and you can see these here, they are slow in consuming yeast. So they have a cake there, but they are slow. On the other hand, Saccharomyces yeasts 
they are incredibly fast, so they just suck glucose in. Why do they do that? If we look on the genomes now, here you have 20 transporters of glucose, and here you have one to two. So one driving force in evolution was independent gene duplications of transporters, just sucking in and stealing from others. So that's one thing. When there is little glucose, if these guys are present, they'll just put it in. The same kinetics with ethanol, so the production here is very fast. So it's a very high flow through glycolysis, now comparing to those here and those they're not producing at all. So fast to eat, fast to produce ethanol, and these then poisons the rest, right? So they don't have time to go into the respiration part. But with the biomass kinetics, see the green bar here, it's almost of the same size in all of them. So because they are just eating, spitting, eating, spitting, eating sugar, spitting ethanol now, they can still make enough energy so that they can grow at the same speed as crap negative. But for these, it's not only transporters which are important. There are also other things, for example, other gene duplications and other rewirings, which I don't have time to go into next time. So this is just showing you the statistics of the groups. Here you had differences, right, in these parameters. But when you come to the growth rate, the growth rate in all yeasts is more or less the same. In YPD, they divide approximately every two hours. Right? So conclusions on growth rate. The growth rate is very similar among all yeasts. The kinetics of ethanol production or kinetics of, of glucose consumption is then very different. So this is again a, a way to, to, to compensate now that only part of the carbon is used. Okay, so where do we put now our Arrow, we put it here now, anaerobic capability of the origin, they overlap. And as I told you at the beginning, these two events, I still have difficulties to distinguish, but it took place at the same time. When this group, or the progenitors of this group, separated from the others approximately 125 years ago now, so we have also the origin of CREP3 effect and it overlaps with the origin of the first modern fruits. And it took place after the loss of respiratory complex, a very puzzling thing now. Why, why is it happening? It also took place in Schizosaccharomyces pomba, for example. This one diminishes you the energy for approximately 10 to 20% in the respiratory part because it pushes less protons out of the mitochondrion, the energy which is then converted into ATP. So Lachancia is they are living fossils. That's one of the conclusions. And we pushed the origin 25 million years back in evolution. And it's progressive thing. So these are living fossils. This is something what we want to play now with and see if we analyze it into details, we can find out what mechanisms it has in common with cerevisian carbon metabolism. And then we can say, this is the first mechanism which evolved. Even if carbon metabolism, you may feel it's very well studied in Saccharomyces, it is. But still many molecular mechanisms behind. MIG-1 is well understood. This is one transcription factor. But many, they are not. This was a big surprise for me. So even if it's so important from biotech point of view, alcohol production, we still don't understand molecular biology because there is not one trigger, but there are many different mechanisms operating on the gene level, promoter level, you have networks, and then you also have the regulatory checkpoints at the enzyme level. Okay, let's go into the second part. I still have one hour, right? Yes. Yes, okay. Very good, yeah. Now we have 10 more minutes. So there's another PhD student, Nerve. Now it's a part of the Cornucopia project. So he tried to evolve some of bad alcohol producers. They are bad not because of mutations, but they are bad of, because of their origin, because of the phylogenetic 
position now and try to evolve them in the lab into good producers. And how would you do that? Well, we used the reconstructed situation from 100 million years ago when yeast had to compete with bacteria. So this is what we used as a trigger to irritate yeast all the time with bacteria. And then they have to evolve something to outcompete in the lab. And this something could be ethanol. Could be something else also. So let's see. And bacteria we used to irritate yeasts, they would differ in their sensitivity to ethanol. So some would be sensitive already on 1%, some would be sensitive on higher. OK, so what do we do? Or what did NERV do for the last three years now? This experiment is approximately two to three days. So you inoculate yeast. Then very soon you add bacteria. And after a day, you add antibiotic to kill the bacteria. And then you dilute yeast, and you start the new batch. And again, you add bacteria, and then you poison them. We don't want to evolve bacteria. Always the same bacterium for several cycles now, and just evolving yeast, and then regularly freezing yeast. So we have minus 80 freezer full of, full of, full of these different generations. And we would go up to 1,200 generations now. So one generation, we will get approximately five to 10 generations per experiment. So you can see now, it's approximately 200 times to change now. And he had to cut down quite early the number of these yeast species and then focus mainly on the living fossil. So this is our main yeast we want to evolve, so to be more competitive with bacteria, and we're hoping that it will produce also more ethanol now. And well, we did some of the bioinformatics stuff on this one. Now it seems to be a, a primitive yeast, and then perfect for longitudinal experiments. And be before already, we developed transformation system, targeted deletion system. We have libraries, and it's sequenced, and so on, and so on. OK. so. These are some of the evolved strains. Now, these are generations, 240, 480 generations, and the last one now. And what we want to see is how the glucose consumption evolves, if they will be faster to suck in glucose, how the ethanol kinetics is, what are the amounts of ethanol, what is the growth rate, and then also fitness now. And then it's all in red, it's compared to the original, to the grandfather, the original strain. So it is one now. And you can see, for example, in this one, the glucose consumption is much better now. So they're faster to consume it. And also, ethanol yield now, it's here. Production now, it's getting higher than one. So they are really evolving into what we wanted them to evolve, into better ethanol producers. So this is the growth now, the ancestor here now, and then you have different, different generations now. And what's interesting here is that one of these evolved strains, look, this is glucose consumption. This is the control strains of the first generations. It's now really fast to suck in now glucose. So it really steals from bacteria much faster. But also, if you look at the ethanol production, so they are poor producers of ethanol here at the beginning, now the ancestor and the, the first generation, but then you get much better. So these are the experiments from the flasks now, so that's why they are not so precise. Then all these strains, they are tested in the fermenters. This is just the first analysis now. And then they are also telling you that these parameters, they increase from one in the progenitor into higher values. So it's really something to do with the carbon metabolism. This is more detailed kinetics here now. Uh, more detailed physiological studies in the fermenter. And, and this is the conclusion here. So if you look, the ancestor of La Chancia Cluivery and the evolved strain, 1,200 generations, the ethanol production is now really better. The yield is from 0.2 so 20% of sugar 
goes into ethanol in the original one, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it would be here, right? But this one has really evolved. Something has happened that it makes more. And just like CREP3 positives, it decreased the biomass because sugar is really now converted into ethanol and not into biomass. And the other products, they are still relatively low. So what we did here, from La Chancia Cluivery in two years, we did what the creator of the universe did in 100 million years now. We created from La Chancia Cluivery a kind of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, right? With the specific rates here. It's all fitting now. So Cluivery evolved in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And when we have this mutant now, it will always win against bacteria. It will be much better in competition. Now we have to see what the genetic background is. So you mentioned now how many labs were you to sequence the Saccharomyces cerevisiae? Hundreds. Yeah. Here now you just send your strain somewhere and then they sequence it practically overnight and the cost now is much over 10,000 euro what we are paying. This is done by our collaborator in Taiwan where they have enormous capacities left after the, the, the human genome sequencing. So we are doing also a little bit bigger coverage than before now. We go approximately between 100 and 1,000 we try to do. That's 40 billion euros to it twice. <laughs> At that time. Yeah. Uh, so last two years ago, I had my first Decara bruxellensis genome published now. It was one master student project now. That's what the situation is. The next master student now is working on sequencing of 20 Candida glabrata. They're completed. They were completed in, in, in one week. Is this all done by final sequencing by Lumina? I have no idea. I send, they do it. Yeah. They send us data. It's the analysis, which is now even bigger problem now. It's now cheap. So this is the evolved strain. This is the parental we <coughs> covered now. And then we hoped, well, we will find the genes of carbon metabolism that are changed now, either in the promoter part or in the open reading part. But it was not so easy as you'll see now. So it's, yeah, this is just the technical data. This is really high quality, really high quality now sequence we have. So close to 100% of coverage we get with this data now. SNPs we looked like, no? SNPs, they are a bit different in the, our parent from the sequence strain, sequenced in 2003, published in Nature. 2004, I think it was Bernard de Jean's Nature paper. Here we find SNPs in this one, and here we expected more SNPs, right? But they are less, okay. I'm sorry to say this took me one month to understand now. So what's going on? This is a diploid, hetero. This one became homo. <laughs> it took me one month. To <laughs> it's amazing. It tells about aging, at least in my case. So one thing we could see was homogenization of this strain. So still among these SNPs, there should be some interesting maybe to tell us now. The parental strain, the evolved strain now, we have 57 genes similar to Cerevisia. Here a majority with SNPs anyway. They are, they are unique genes now. And in this evolved one, which has less SNPs, only 12 genes, they are similar to Cerevisia. And then we do functional analysis hoping there would be something easy to explain with carbon metabolism. Those events which see, we see in Cerevisia on the promoter levels, we changed in evolution. Catastrophe. Protein transport, the main family. What has protein transport do? Here in the parental one, most of SNPs would be in metal ion transport, signal peptide nothing to do with carbon metabolism. So we know one important thing, the change is from hetero into homo, right? But we don't know really what's going on. Here are some of the things which change. Now metal ion transport has changed. This would rather have something to do with the anaerobic, aerobic, right? Protein transport, no idea what has to do with the elevated ethanol production. 
I'm completely lost. I have to finish. Arne Hagman did his PhD, defended it a month ago on fermento studies, the first part, which is part published in PLOS One, one article. There's another one under consideration, and there is a third one to be submitted. Nerv, a PhD student, in the middle of his studies, he did lab evolution. For fermentations, my main collaborator, Conchetta Compagno from Milan, obviously coming from the same country as you do, and then Yun Yi Liu from Taipei, charge of the sequencing platform at the academy in Taiwan is a collaborator, and then many other master students also. And where am I moving now? I'm moving very soon to the new institute, it's uh, one of the best food sciences departments in, in Europe now. It's also one of the best European universities. I'm going back to Copenhagen University. So this, this is where my labs will be. This is where my office will be. This has been completed a month ago now. Thanks for listening. <laughs>